Uh, so um, our sister church in San Antonio is a week behind us. They've been going through the same uh, lessons. In fact, sometimes <clears throat> he uh, takes my notes. Um, but this Sunday, he didn't even get really get a chance uh, to, to, and he's been doing it on Sunday mornings. He didn't get a chance to really um, uh, deliver the lesson because he asked uh, them what their thoughts are on the things that they've been learning. And they basically just, as they talked back and forth with each other, basically just preached his sermon. It was really something. One of the things, as we're talking about uh, being free, actually free from sin, they said, now these are mostly new believers, but one of the ladies said, uh, so when Jesus told that guy, your sins are forgiven, and then he said, go and sin no more, he meant it. Like, yeah, he did. That's what he said. Go and sin no more. And so as we've been studying, we've been saying here that when you received Jesus as Savior and you came up with two natures, Uh, I'm not talking necessarily about the Holy Spirit here. I'm talking about when you were born again, that something was added that wasn't there before. We call that the Spirit, the regenerated man, the re renewed man, the new man, whatever you want to say. But I want you to notice that, that we say it's self, but notice that I put the word self-centered. Tonight, we're going to look at the fiery darts of the adversary. We have been looking at how to be a, living a life of holiness how we can practically, actually live a life of holiness. And we've taken now six weeks. This is the seventh week. This week we're going to be looking at the fiery darts that Satan will use to get you to sin. And I want you to notice this right here. This is going to be at the root of every one of your failings. Before you met Jesus as your Savior, before you accepted him as your Savior, you and every other person on this planet ordered your lives around yourselves. When you looked for a woman to marry, it was, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to find a woman that fulfills me. I want to find a woman that makes me happy. When we look at our jobs and everything that we do, if, if, we, if we have not received Jesus as our Savior, the entire world lives its life self-centered. Even when they are giving, I, I remember in business, they would say, well, we're, we're going to support this charity and this charity, you know, whatever it was, Lions Club, whatever. And I would ask the owner of the company, who was not a believer, why? Receive. I'm going, so it's not about the charity. It's about it just works that you receive. And he goes, oh, no, no, it's, it's about the charity too. And I'm, I'm like, so what, what about the charity? He, he, well, it makes me feel good to give to him. So it's still about you. Does everybody see that? And that is the opposite of who Jesus is. Jesus is always giving. Even when he doesn't give, the reason he doesn't give is for your benefit. And when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, what, what, you, what you end up is this, this, when you first became a believer, it was easy, and then we taught you how to settle down. But it, it goes like this. The world, until a guy named Copernicus came along, except for those who read the book of Isaiah, the world believed that the earth was at the center of the universe and the sun went around the earth. Christians believed it. Everyone, that's just the way it is. And this guy named Copernicus does the math and he goes, that doesn't work. And he proves 
that the earth goes around the sun, and it's called the Copernicus Revolution. It was the second blow against the Catholic Church that, that ended what they considered to be the Golden Age. The, the, the Reformation was a huge, um, had a huge impact. The northern part of Europe suddenly became Protestant. But then the Copernicus Revolution uh, really was a death knell in many ways because the church had been teaching that the sun revolved around the earth. And suddenly science comes along and proves it different. And so it, 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 it destroyed the credibility. The, the radical transformation in our thinking is, is huge. The, the same thing. When you were born, you are self and your parents revolve around you, your wife revolves around you, your teacher revolves around you. You're the center of the universe. When you look out of your eyes and you look around, you're the center of the universe. When you become born again, Christ comes along and goes, um, that was never true. I want you to focus your life and all that you are on serving and loving God and others. It is absolutely opposite of what we were born with naturally. When a person receives Jesus as their Savior and suddenly this revolution happens and they're so happy and they're like, finally, I have a purpose in life. Everything makes sense. And then they go to church for a while and we get them fixed. Actually, you pray. God does what you want. Here's some verses you can use to manipulate Him. It's all about you. <clears throat> so as we look at the fiery darts that the adversary is going to use, you're going to see the common denominator in all of them is he appeals to self. Now, we saw this, that you have the tripartite, tripartite um, environment that you live in, which is Satan against you. He is your adversary. The world around you, meaning all of the corruption and stuff that you're inundated with all the time, everything you see, all that you hear, there's just sewage pumping into you. And then the worst one of all, the one that is most powerful, is the flesh within you. And in fact, the world and Satan, this is what they play off of. So you've got that, you know, we're just reviewing right now, you've got this as your as your environment. And so what we want to do tonight is we're looking at the fiery darts of Satan. So you want to get an idea of what is he doing? And how is he doing it? Because I want you to recognize what he's doing within you and doing around you <clears throat> so that you will be able to live a holy life and to resist him and to live for your God instead of for that God. So first of all, let's look at a couple of Bible verses. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 16 says this, In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. And this tells you, I don't want to get into right now, the truth of the matter is that Satan is throwing fiery darts against you. Right now, Lucina, Satan is throwing fiery darts against you. He never sleeps. He never stops. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We don't want to be outwitted by Satan. And the way that we are not outwitted by him is by knowing his designs. And when we say designs, his plans for you. He has big plans for you. That, are you okay now? Can you stay okay? So, 2 Corinthians 2.11 Alright, so our first fiery dart 
And don't shut down as you see this. This is the first fiery dart that he uses. That passage of Scripture that I just read to you, could you put it back up here for me, please, Nathaniel, first, or 2 Corinthians 2.11? It says, So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. The context of that is verse 10. If you'll put up 2 Corinthians 2.10. have forgiven if I have forgiven anything has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. The context is forgiveness here. Knowing his schemes. Uh, Satan wants to bring things into your life that you'll have resentments and he wants you to have unforgiveness. That is his scheme. That's just one of his schemes. However, it may be the one that catches most uh, people who are legitimately trying to walk with God. All right, so let's talk about this for a moment. What is the root of this unforgiveness? I have taken offense. Why have I taken offense? Well, uh, it, it goes right to self. I'm hurt. I am hurt. He hurt me. She hurt me. I am embarrassed. Somebody spell that for me. I, I am embarrassed. He embarrassed me. My rights have been infringed upon. He took my place. She took my place. It what causes the offense, what causes the hurt, is self. The unforgiveness, first of all, the injury is myself was injured, my ego was injured. The unforgiveness is the unwillingness to let the other fellow off the hook for that. What, what, why is it? And what do we say? First thing we say is, well, but what if he does it again? I might get hurt again. I am more concerned about myself than God or Him or anyone around me. How many times do we forgive? Seven times? Well, what if He keeps doing it? I've got to protect what? Myself. This is a scheme. Of Satan. Let me just give you a couple of verses here. Well, first of all, let's let me let me name a few. And and know this that even as believers, when we say I have forgiven him or I have forgiven her, no matter how many years it goes, Satan is constantly trying to stir that and get the forgiveness to go away. He's scheming against you. All right, so here are some places. <clears throat> Abusive parent. I can never forgive him. What he did to, can somebody finish the certain? Me. I can never forgive him. Not after what he did to Is that what Jesus would say? And even if you do forgive him, Satan is going to bring up those memories over and over and over because he never stops throwing the fiery dart. And through faith, the shield of faith, you are to say, look, if I do what the Lord told me to do, he is going to take care of me. I'm going to obey him 
He will protect me. He will take care of me. Um, uh, somebody that, that you know, a, a, a partner that, that is unfaithful. That's, do I forgive them? A wife that divorces. Those are, these are deep. Surely Jesus wouldn't expect even that to be forgiven. What, what would you answer to that? Does Jesus actually expect and command that that be forgiven too? Is there absolutely, is there any way at all that we can say, I hear what your command is, Lord. However, you just don't understand the circumstances. Lord, I, I know what you're telling me. However, you just don't, you don't get it, what it's really like to have a best friend betray you. But he does, doesn't he? Now, how, how serious is God about this? First of all, in the model prayer, what the, of all of the things that he teaches us to pray, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's about it as far as the prayer topics, except and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And when you look at Luke, that's the end of the prayer. Oh, I'm sorry. Lead us not into temptation. <laughs> well, he's tempting you constantly to hold the grudge. So unforgiveness is a fiery dart. We've looked at various sins, and we have uh, discovered according to scriptures that Jesus Christ does live inside of us, that he has conquered sin, that he's within us. And so we absolutely can be done with this. Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to ask you to turn there. Matthew 18. Um, by the way, just a, a comment on this. Matthew chapter 18. This um, this a big part of this chapter. Uh, you know, there's a parable here here that he tells where it's all about forgiving. It's a large passage of scripture that's all about forgiving. How much does Jesus talk about giving? Of giving money? How much does he talk about that? A verse here? No, he doesn't talk hardly at all about giving money. Now we all do pretty good with that. But he talks a whole lot about forgiving and that's the thing that we struggle with. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Right before this, he tells the parable of the lost sheep. Verse 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountainside and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went away. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. <coughs> and then the very next thing is about forgiveness. If your brother sins against you. If Tom sins against me, if he sins, Against me. He's the lost sheep that God wants to find. And he looks at God looks at me and says, You're okay. I'm going to leave you here and I'm going to go find Tom. How can I not forgive Tom knowing that you're the lost sheep that he's going out to find? Don't follow the subheadings, just read it in context. They divide it and it separates. The topic. 
my stepfather hurt me. My father hurt me. They are the one that the shepherd is going to travel across mountains and rivers to find. Now, if he feels that way for them, how can I possibly feel anger towards them or unforgiveness and still be his child, still have my have the mind of Christ in me, still be obeying his command. Whoever offends you is the one that Christ is trying to reach. He says, if your brother sins against you, protect yourself. Forgive him, but don't forget. Make sure that you put boundaries so that he can't do it again in verse 15. I think it said that somewhere there, didn't it? No. If your brother sins against you, go get your brother from the church and go talk to him. Verse 15 says. If that doesn't work, now take two. If that doesn't work, take the elders. Why? Because he's a lost sheep. Well, that changes how I look at people all of a sudden. Because I'm looking at them instead of me. And then he tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. Verses 21. Do you see how it all goes together? Immediately he tells the story about the unforgiving servant. I would like you to look at Verse 32, Matthew 18, 32. It says, Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. Who is that? The one who didn't forgive. You, th I didn't write this. I didn't tell Jesus to say this. Jesus says, You got these two guys. One owned, owed the master a great sum, and the little guy owed the ower a little sum. Anyone here ever owed God? Have you ever been in debt to God? You ever sinned? Forgive us our debts. Okay. And the story goes, God forgives this guy, and then this guy comes who, who, who did nothing compared to what... My father did nothing to me compared to what I did to my heavenly father over the years. That's the point Jesus is making. He did one little thing against me, or two, or ten. I spent decades sitting against my heavenly father. And he forgave me. He forgave me, and he didn't go, well, i got to protect myself. Well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. As far as east is from the west, as far as, as, as the deepest sea, he has forgiven me. Now this guy comes along, my father or my stepfather has done some damage to me, and I say, you know what? I know that Jesus requires it, but it's just it's just above me. I just I'm pretty sure that, that he'll excuse me for not forgiving this person. And Jesus' words is Randy, you wicked servant. And then what does he say? I'm throwing you in jail. Verse 32, that you wicked servants. And, and this is the thing about unforgiveness that I want you to, to, to recognize. Let me find my place here. If, if we go ahead and think of the person right now, go ahead and think of the person right now that you've not been able to forgive and you've justified it somehow and said, well, even God wouldn't expect me to forgive that. If you've got somebody like that in your life, you are in prison. He's not in prison. He's free, having a great time. He doesn't even know you're mad at him. But you are bound to that. And you're in prison. Somebody has said this. Unforgiveness is the poison that I drink trying to kill the other guy. Do you see that? Why is God telling us to forgive? Number one, it is a huge 
insult to His holiness if He forgives, but you don't. But number two, He loves you. And, it, and Satan uses this. This does not come from God. This comes from Satan, and it appeals to the self inside of you, and he has put you in jail, and you don't even know it. And Jesus is coming and saying, I want to set you free. Well, well Lord, how can you set me free? This person, uh, shh, shh. But God, I'm telling you, I mean, it's just on my mind, and I just can't, shh, shh. But see, I just can't, I can't. Did I die for you? Yes. Did I die for him? Yes. Are his sins your business or mine? When David says, against you and you only have I sinned, the person that sinned against you, he didn't sin against you. He only sinned against God. And who are you to judge another man's servant, Paul says. Have I hammered on this enough, folks? Can you forgive? This is the number one sin in church. And I'll tell you, I believe it's the number one sin in our church because almost every one of us has someone that Satan constantly brings up and we don't forgive. And that's a sin. That's perhaps the biggest fiery dart but he's not done there. He's got some others. Here's the, you know what? Let me, let me write that back up. Let me, so we can keep a, a tally, right? And please forgive me if I misspell anything. Get that, see what I did there, Tom? I don't know if anybody has any problems with this. This comes from Satan. If you're going, you know what, I've just got a temper. You have an adversary that knows exactly what buttons to push to bring this out of you. And he's plotting against you. He's scheming right now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27 says this. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to unforgiveness. There were two more verses. I'm sorry. Ephesians 4.32. Back to unforgiveness. Ephesians 4.32. What's it say? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, if you're saying to yourself, you know what, I hear you, Pastor, but I just can't do this, and I'm sure that God will forgive me, will you take like a marker or a razor blade, and would you please just cut that verse out of your Bible? Just go ahead and mutilate your Scripture. Because if you leave that verse in the Bible, then you have to do it. Because it's a command. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Can I read that again? Without which no one will see the Lord. Do you see that? How serious is God? Without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. That root of bitterness, of unforgiveness, defiles you. You are not right with God. You are not right with God if you have unforgiveness in your heart. So now back to the anger issue. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity. Notice that. Give no opportunity to the devil. Now, anger is an involuntary emotion. It's a subconscious psychological response. So, um, involuntary. If you didn't try to get mad, Involuntary emotion. You didn't say, I think I'm going to get angry, right? You didn't plan it. You didn't go, okay, okay at, at uh, 7.53 on Wednesday, I'm going to go ahead and get mad. It's involuntary. It's an emotion. But where does it come from? Oh. 
that guy, you guys will help me finish the little phrase. That guy disrespected. Do you know why the women across the United States of America are weeping and gnashing their teeth right now? They took away my constitutional right with the Roe v. Wade decision. Listen to them talk. They stole my constitutional right. They're treating us women as a subclass citizen. Do you see where the anger is? Um, when the, when the guys when the guys driving in front of you and there's a gap between you and the car ahead and you had planned for that gap and the guy suddenly darts in there he he did what what did he do he took what my space he just stole my spot have you ever done this you're sitting at the yellow waiting you know so that you can turn left and the other guy is barreling down there right. And, and, and then he keeps on going long after the yellow has been there. And then you have to sit through the next whole set of lights because he took your yellow. I mean, you paid for it with the green, didn't you? You pulled up there, it was green. You sat there and waited and you paid for it. Zoom, zoom, yellow, my turn. And then this guy, and now it's red. He took my yellow. Have you ever heard of road rage? Do you see what's happening here? He demeaned my idea. I had an idea, and he just shot it down. He demeaned, demeaned me. He minimized me. Do you see self-screaming in all of this? Is that who you want running your life, self or spirit? Let me just tell you this. It is really hard to lose when you've got nothing invested in the game. It's really hard to lose when you're not fighting for self. How can I do that? I'm going to walk my day with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he's walking with me, it's Psalms 23. Maybe I'm in green pastures, maybe I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, but I just don't care. He takes my yellow, I have to sit here. Man, I just cannot believe that guy just took 51 seconds of my day. How dare he? If I had a gun, 51. Do you realize how incredibly silly we are about this stuff? Anger is this involuntary emotion when somebody steps on My, my toes, if my toes weren't out there, if self were not so big, maybe I've got really giant clown toes sticking out there. That's basically where we're at. James chapter 1 verse 20 says that, I, I don't want to read this because it's too convicting. What's it say? Somebody read that for me. Those two don't go together. Pastor, are you telling me that I can live a life where I'm free of unforgiveness and anger? I'm telling you that you have a substitutionary death. Jesus died for your sins, and you have a substitutionary life. The life that we live, we live in Christ. It is Christ living in us. Yes, you can. All you have to do is just do what Jesus said. Crucify self. All right, so there we can overcome this sin. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Let me just say this real quick. Here's this involuntary emotion, and here's why this is so deadly. Someone is the target 
of my anger. It is pointed at someone. You may not even be in the room and I'll curse a blue streak at you, but it's pointed at you. My anger, your anger, someone that Christ died for is the target. So this Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up. Did you all hear that? If, if we read that again, not like just a Bible verse that we go, you know, mumble, 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 but we actually look at what our Lord is saying, don't say anything that's not building up. As fits the occasion that might give grace to those who hear. Might give what? Mercy, by the way, according to Spurgeon, mercy always has to be unearned or else it's not mercy. Mercy is a gift that you give away, not because he deserved it, but because you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and Christ lives in you and he gives mercy, and so you give mercy too. When self dies, Christ lives. What comes out of you is mercy and grace. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. How much did Christ forgive you? But when you have forgiven somebody that much, come and talk to me. Maybe, maybe you don't have to forgive anymore. When he, you have forgiven as much as Christ has forgiven you. We can overcome this sin of anger. All that has to happen is self die the Copernicus revolution in your life. Now Satan schemes against you to constantly get you back into the center of that circle when you're supposed to be on the outer ring going around others. When you give your life, what does it say? Therefore, brothers, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable act of worship. Then you'll be able to determine the, the will of God the perfect and pleasing will of God. And as you give yourself away, as you just give it out there, instead of losing, what does Jesus say? If you'll lose your life for my sake, he's not talking about martyrdom there. Look at the context. He's talking about discipleship. When you quit living for self and you start saying, I am going to live tomorrow for every single person around me. I'm going to live my life for everyone else's benefit. He says, if you'll lose your life in that way, you'll find it. Finally, on the other hand, if you try to protect yourself, you will lose your life. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about salvation here. I'm talking about life full and abundant, the life that he died to give you. And you may go, you know what, Pastor, this is, just doesn't sound very American at all. It doesn't sound business savvy. doesn't sound reasonable. The cross is not reasonable. And the followers of the one who died there cannot be reasonable either. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7, speaking of lawsuits, he says, to, to lo have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Let the guy take the yellow. There's a special place in hell for him. That's between him and God. But let him take the yellow. Okay? Do you know every time that that happens to me, do you know what happens? Almost every time. Somebody sees it and goes, go ahead. Thank you. That's a whole lot better than getting my yellow, isn't it? That this guy did that. The Lord has a way of, we, we, we put out these fiery darts by faith. The Lord has a way of taking care of us. All right, so we've got unforgiveness and we've got anger. Here's the next one. Oh, no, I, there's just no way that Pastor Randy really expects me to overcome my anger. Yes, he does. 
here's something I found out early on as a pastor, uh, and it was something that Mary Lou McDowell uh, said to me that humiliated me, which, by the way, the only way that I know to get humility is to be humiliated. She said it so gently, and she said it so sweet. But I was talking about how things were going bad here at the church, and I was angry, and I was sitting at her table, and I was with anger talking about how come they just can't get it, and, and why why is this person doing this, and why did this person just do that? And sweet, old. Mary Lou McDowell looked across the table at me with that, you know, she looked like the grandmother from over the hills and through the woods, you know, thing. She looks at me and she goes, you know, what I found is usually we get angry when we don't get our way. Boy, I was so mad at her. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just went. I just went. All of this is because of my willfulness. All of this anger is because I want to get my way. And all of you are supposed to be circling around me and I'm supposed to be the center of your universe. And you just don't get it. You keep insisting that I circle around you. You put God in the middle and say, my life, I am nothing but a slave to Jesus Christ for him to use however he wants. And you will finally have prosperity. Here's the next one. Now remember, I'm not just taking a list here and going, hey, here's the places we messed up. I'm going through the scriptural list of the fiery darts that your adversary uses against you. And where do they hit? They hit in self. Here's the third one. He will use this all the time. Let us go to the original doubt to see what it, what it looks like. The very first doubt of all times. Genesis chapter 3. Turn there, please. Genesis chapter 3. I want you to see this like we did on the other one without any chapter breaks or anything. And follow with me as I read verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty. We're talking about our adversary throwing fiery darts at us. And Genesis tells me he's sneaky. Or as Gollum would say, he's tricksy. If you're not a Lord of the Ring person, then sorry. I'll tell jokes in a moment. Now the servant was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? First thing he does is he gets you to question scripture. By the way, could I could I get the answer from you uh, on this? Did did the Lord God uh, uh, say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? No. She she should have said no. He didn't say that. He said you can eat of every tree in the garden except that one. I've got. I've got more trees than the, the national debt of the United States I can eat from. And then there's one I can't. That's what he said. That, see where doubt starts here? Did God actually say he uses scripture? Verse uh, 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. God said you will die. I'm telling you, God is a liar. Uh, in fact, let me just let me just play the devil's advocate for a moment. Right now in this class, of course, we all know that God is a liar. Because he said that he has set you free from sin, and you know that you're not. So obviously, God lied. Or maybe you're screwing up. Doubt is the way that he will destroy your faith faster than anything else. And it goes with this. Did God say, God lied, God is selfish? Which is why one of the reasons why I oppose hyper-Calvinism.
verse 4, but the serpent said, you will not really uh, surely die. And what is the very next verse? Somebody, somebody read the next verse after verse 4. God has some really bad motives. That's why he lied to you. God lied to you because God has, has a larceny in his heart. Well, well how, how does that play out today? I thought for sure that if I did this, God would do this. And then Satan's fiery dart. Didn't God say he would do it? Well, I thought he said that he would do it. I heard the guy at Abundant Living read the verse. Joel Olstein, he held a Bible and said something. I'm sure it was there. Yeah, so God lied to you because God just wanted your offering. You have an anticipation, you have an expectation. It doesn't pan out the way that you go. Immediately, Satan throws that dart. Maybe God's not who he says he is. Maybe God really doesn't love you. Maybe God doesn't even hear you. Maybe God is a bad God. That's not your imagination doing that. When that happens, that is the fiery dart of Satan. We question Scripture or we try to squeeze Scripture. Satan convinces us, take this verse and move it around to make it say what you want it to say. Or we, or we, we, we justify our sinful behavior rather than accepting what God says. God says, clear and simple, this. And we go, well, he says that, but I'm pretty sure that's hyperbole. He doesn't really mean joy unspeakable. Nobody has joy unspeakable. My little bit of trickle of joy is probably what he meant. And he just uses hyperbole. He doesn't mean ecstatic, off the charts, giggling happiness. I know that's the word that he used. But it's just hyperbole. It's just, it's just something that we use to, you know, uh, so the guy can preach a, a higher sermon. But he doesn't mean that. And so therefore... This little trickle of life joy that I have is probably what he was talking about, and so I'm probably okay and I'm going to stay here. Who do you think just led that conversation with you? You didn't come up with that on your own. The same crafty serpent that talked to Eve just ran that scenario by you. He says I'm to have joy unspeakable. If I do not have joy unspeakable, are you ready? Are you ready? There's something wrong with me. I'm not obeying him. I'm justifying things away. I'm settling for a minimum Christianity. At the Casa in San Antonio, the way that they portrayed this was this. The pastor took a balloon out, and he blew it up. Pretty good-sized balloon. He blew it up. And then you know how you tie a balloon off at the end? And you got the little flap hanging there, the little thing that the kids suck on and slobber and it's all nasty. The thing you tie a string to. Nick said, this balloon is the life that God has given you. And Satan wants to tie it off right there. But the only thing you've got is a little flap of, well, I'm saved and I'm not going to hell. And the rest of that balloon is yours. And he's tied you off there. And how does he do that? With doubt. I'm telling you that if the Bible says that whole big balloon is yours, he's not kidding. The whole big balloon is yours. But the fiery dart of Satan has left you with a slobbery little tab on the end. So, but he's... he's you know, he's constantly tricking us, stealing from us. All right, here's the next one. Now, these are just fiery darts. I'm not, I'm not going, here's a list of things that we struggle with. 
I'm telling you, these are the darts that are listed. Who is the author of pride? Who is the first follower of pride? Who is the first follower of self? I will ascend. I will do this. I will do this. He is the ultimate self-centered narcissist. And then he accuses God of being a narcissist. He accuses God to you. How come God demands all of this? What, does he want to be the center of the universe? Okay, first of all, friend, he is the center of the universe. And as soon as you get that figured out, you'll start having a universe that makes sense and matches up with what Scripture says. But he's not the center of the universe because he wants to be the center of the universe. He's the center of the universe because he's the creator of it. He's the author of it. It all springs from him. Without him, not one molecule will hold together. I'm glad he's at the middle of things or we would have all flown apart. So here's some scriptures. I don't need to talk much. Can you see self in pride? Can you all see self in pride? Do you like pride in yourself? I mean, that, to me, that is like, you know, I don't know, having a really obnoxious, smelly boil. That's what it's like. And I've had plenty of it. I, I don't want any more. Here's some verses. James 4, 7. I would like you to notice this verse that all of you know. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We're talking about him throwing fiery darts. There's James 4, 7. Resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. And the funny thing about James 4, 7, believe it or not, it comes right after James 4, 6, which says this. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the context of James 4, 7. Pride. He says this, look, pride, you're proud, resist the devil. God opposes the proud, therefore resist the devil. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 speaks of the thorn in the flesh. You all remember Paul having a thorn in the flesh? Why was he given the thorn in the flesh? to keep me from becoming conceited is at the end of the verse. All right, in pride, let me just, okay, so I'm, I'm really, I promise, I'm not like throwing rocks at anyone in particular. It's just if I throw this rock out here, it hits almost all of us. Okay, so somebody help me with the spelling. Self-sufficiency, self-confidence, I forgive you, Tom, self-confidence. Do you see how that played out? It's yeah, nothing to it. You lost sheep, you. <laughs> These two separate us from God. This is tough on businessmen. I had a dream because I didn't want to be a pastor, so I had decided to open a business and to do a business the way the Scripture talked about it. And it was going to be a business built on prayer, no self-sufficiency, no self-confidence, a business just where God was the shepherd. It was wonderful. I was supposed to be a pastor, so he closed it. But while it lasted, it was glorious. Um, the, the way that those two separate you from God, they separate you from God because you don't need his help. So you don't ask. You don't come to him because you don't need him. Genesis 11, 4. I've got a whole lot of verses here. Tower of Babel. Come, let us build ourselves a city and tower with its top of the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Let us make a name for ourselves. Deuteronomy 8, 16 through 18. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do uh, good in the end? 
Beware lest you say in your heart, beware lest you say in your heart, my power, my might, or the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God for it. It's he who gives you power to get you wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Here's how this plays out. Can you imagine how incredibly ridiculous it would be for me to be proud of how tall I am? And yet, how many people are? What did I do to get tall? Nothing. I'm proud to be an American. What did I do? What great thing did I do in the beforehand, up in heaven, when, according to the Mormons, my spirit was floating around? What great thing did I do that, that uh, uh, earned me to be born at Mennonite Hospital in Bloomington, Illinois? proud to be an American. Did I fight World War II? Did I help write the Constitution? How? I'm proud to be an American? The truth is this. There is not anything that you have that you have not received from God. If you tell me my hands work this, who gave you the fingers? Plural. God, if you tell me my intelligence, my discipline, my imagination, who gave that to you? Did you create it? You have. There is nothing you have, nothing, that has not been given to you from God. How can you be proud? Well, wait a minute, Randy. As the actor would say, I just don't get this skit. What is my motivation in this scene? If I'm not going to be striving in order to... By the way, the Olympics. Wow, we love that. Look at that. He conquered. He strove in order to conquer. To get a gold medal for his country. Why did he do it? If that's not my motivation, if my motivation is not going to be to, to achieve all that I can achieve, then why do I live? How do I get up in the morning? What is my purpose in life? To absolutely serve God with all of my might and to love those around me. And if you will do that, you will exceed any Olympic gold medal winner. You will be so far above to die to self. You will finally receive the crown of life. Who has deceived us? Who has stolen us from us the life that Jesus died to give us? You all know the story of Gideon. Judges 7, 2, the Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Mennonites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Isaiah 2, 12. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Do you understand why Satan wants you to be proud? Because it will put you under the judgment of God. It will separate you from God. Isaiah 5.21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Let me just tell you this right now. If it weren't for Google, I wouldn't know anything. I just Google stuff all the time. Google it. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Isaiah 10, 12 through 13. When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. Here's what the king of Assyria did. God raised him up to use him as a tool. And the king of Assyria said, look at what I have conquered, just like Nebuchadnezzar did. And God said, because of that, because you did not acknowledge that all that you have, you did not accomplish, but I gave it to you. Because of that, I will bring my judgment on you. For he says, verse 13, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I have understanding, I remove the boundaries of the peoples and plunder their treasuries like a bull. I bring down those who sit on thrones. And so God said, because you have spoken like that. And the king was killed in his own temple by his two sons.
in this issue with pride. Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira that died at the offering in the first church? Do you all remember that story? Why did they do it? What were they trying to achieve? When Ananias and Sapphira brought their offering and walked down the aisle and placed it into the flame, other people were selling their property and bringing the entire amount. Ananias and Sapphira sold their property and they kept back part of it and they walked down the aisle and put it in there. Why did God kill them? What was it for? Does anybody remember? What was it? No? Lying to the Holy Spirit. What was in their mind as they brought that offering? What caused them? What caused them? See, God said, you could have kept all of it. I'm not killing you for that. You can keep half of it. I'm not killing you for that. What did he kill them for? Pretending like they were bringing all of it in front of the church. Why did they do that? What was in their mind as they walked down that aisle and laid that offering there? Pride generally is you are trying to be exalted in other people's eyes. This is why we get so shocked that we won't give a testimony. What? If I say something wrong, they're going to think I'm low. I'll be embarrassed. I, I'm not going to try to do that because what if I fail? What will they think? You, do, you want to talk about a prison. I'm not going to stand up and talk in front of church because I might embarrass myself. Here's God in heaven who says from the lips of children and infants, he has ordained praise to silence our adversary. And you go, that's fine, but don't expect a word out of me because I would rather you lose your glory than I embarrass myself. And the people in the church might look at me and go, and do you know how stupid that is? Have, has, have the people of this church ever looked down on the smallest child who has shared about Jesus? Sunday night, uh, um, Vanessa was sharing about her student. They were talking about the stars and so forth. What grade level was that, Vanessa? Not your student. Fifth grade? Fifth grade. They're talking about the stars and how big they are and, and, and how grand and how massive and everything. But this, this fifth grader, little boy, says, stands up and asks the question. What was the question he asked? If the stars are that big, does that mean our God's bigger than the stars? This is in a public school, yes? And the teacher said, yes. And the little boy in front of the whole class drops on his knees and says, Glory, adios. Do you think anyone would look down on that child? Why do you think if you speak to the glory of God that somehow you're going to mess it up? It's pride. It is poison. It causes you to do the exact opposite of what your sovereign desires you to do. I can't go any further except just the alternate side of pride. If you're sitting here right now and going, I'm glad I don't have a problem with pride. Aha! Pseudo-humility. Pseudo-humility. When the guy says, uh, well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of a bug on God's sidewalk. Pseudo-humility. There's, there's actually pride all over that. I'm proud of my humility. Okay. And so you get either side. Shyness is not a lack of pride. Shyness may be the most prideful of all. Because you are so afraid of what somebody might think of you. Jesus hung naked on the cross. We get a picture of him being high up on the cross. They weren't that high. Maybe three feet off the ground. The dogs can lick their feet. Just maybe, like if you stood on the chair, maybe just a little bit more. Maybe just like being up here, about this high. 
off the ground. This is how high he stood. He hung naked. Never for a moment being able to cover the pain of his face. Not having the ability to do this or this or this. Naked. us. Can we be, and don't start taking off clothes, we're not starting a cult, but can we be a little more transparent with one another and with the world around us? What are your, uh, next week we'll look at unholy living, creating dissension and adversity because these are all fiery darts of Satan and we'll talk about how to overcome them. What did you hear tonight? What did the Lord say tonight? Self-centeredness is at the root of every one of your failures. Is that what you said? Of, of our faith? Oh, failings. Thank you. Yes, I can agree with that. Yes, what else? I just embarrassed myself. What else? We have a crafty adversary. All right, what else? purpose of the class is for us to get free because he already won. Yeah, absolutely. What else? A Copernicus revolution, right, Brandon? Once in a while I get to have it and it's a good day when that happens. Anything else? He's got us hurting each other, doesn't he? He's got us separated. Yeah. Anything else? 